Hey, 42 here. We humans really know how to hold a grudge, don't we? Take asteroids, for example. One 15 kilometer wide bad apple comes along and wipes out the dinosaurs, and we've just never forgiven them. I mean, this all happened 66 million years ago, and we're still making films about all the different ways we might want to blow them up. It's all a bit petty, really. Especially when you realize we actually have a lot to thank asteroids for. After all, without them, we wouldn't even exist. For one thing, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs provided the ecological breathing room our mammalian ancestors needed to thrive in the subsequent Cenozoic era. But there's even more to it than that. A great big asteroid may have deleted the dinos 66 million years ago, but without asteroids, those same dinosaurs wouldn't even have existed in the first place. And neither would you. You see, many planetary scientists believe it was asteroids, along with their close cosmic cousins, comets, that first delivered water to a parched Earth about 4 billion years ago. Without that ancient bombardment, our planet would have no oceans, no lakes, and no rivers, and therefore, no life. What I'm trying to say is we should be extremely grateful to the entire asteroid community. And if you still aren't quite convinced about what the asteroids have ever done for us, they may just win you over once and for all in the very near future. Star Trek Fleet Command is a cross-play game that is available on desktop, PC, and mobile with a Scopely account. I've been absolutely loving playing Star Trek Fleet Command. I was always a big fan of the TV show, and it brings me back so much nostalgia to play this game today. And Wave Defense introduces a new way for players to socially interact. Players defend a central point from waves of increasingly powerful enemies, and collaboration is the key to success here. Star Trek Enterprise continues into February with the second stage of the Enterprise arc. The classic NX-01 Enterprise is now playable, integrated to the latest X-Borg extension. There's a new epic officer, Captain Archer, and there's a new rare officer, Shran, a fierce and loyal Andorian warrior, known for his cunning and fearlessness in battle. And there are new missions, 10 core Star Trek Enterprise themed missions and 10 side missions. Download Star Trek Fleet Command using the link in my description, then go to Player Profile, Settings, choose General, and sign up for your Scopely account. Then, on the official website, StarTrekFleetCommand.com, log in with your Scopely account to visit the store, open the promo codes page, and enter the code WARPSPEED to redeem your rewards. Then you'll see them when you go back to your game. Install Star Trek Fleet Command by clicking the link in my description, and become a commander in the Star Trek universe today. A big thanks to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. For most of human history, planet Earth felt like a pretty big place, practically packed to bursting with more natural resources than we could ever hope to use. Just 12,000 years ago, there were only about 4 million humans on the entire planet, and they were mostly busy discovering farming. We were a simple species with correspondingly simple needs. Fast forward to today, and there are more than 8 billion of us knocking around, and the closest most of us have ever been to a farm is Stardew Valley. We are increasingly complex creatures, and quite frankly, our various needs are starting to get a bit out of hand. No longer content simply to have a nice cozy cave over our heads and food in our bellies, most of us also need such basic essentials as high-speed internet, Netflix, and at least six uninterrupted hours a day on a mobile phone. But the fancy gizmos and gadgets on which our globe-spanning society is built rely on a variety of hard-to-find materials like cobalt, platinum, gold, terbium, neodymium, and many more. As of right now, we dig these things up out of the ground, but industrial-scale mining has many major drawbacks. For one thing, it's absolutely terrible for the environment, generating huge amounts of pollution and destroying natural habitats on a massive scale. There's also a significant human cost, with the mining of many rare earth elements and precious metals being associated with forced labour, including of children. And it creates serious health issues with nearby communities. But as the global population continues to rise, so does the demand for these materials. And one day, we're going to start running out. Or at the very least, they're going to become so difficult and so expensive to extract that there will be global shortages. When that happens, or ideally sometime before, we're going to need to start doing our shopping in a different supermarket, so to speak. 
And that's where asteroids come in. Well, maybe. Ever since we first went into space, clever scientist types, imaginative sci-fi authors, and people who eat too many mushrooms have been talking about the possibility of mining asteroids. Compared to our solar system's A-list celestial celebrities, the planets and their moons, asteroids don't tend to get a lot of attention or research focus. But what we do know about them suggests they could be gold mines. Like, literally. Asteroids are essentially just leftover material from the formation of the solar system. The crumbs left behind when the great baker in the sky first bunged the planets in the solar oven. Broadly speaking, these crumbs are made from the same sorts of materials that make up planet Earth. But there's a crucial difference. Distribution. Many of Earth's most valuable resources are buried deep underground. That's because when the planet first formed, gravity pulls the heavier elements, including most metals, down to the core, where they remain to this day. For example, scientists believe that around 99% of all the gold on Earth, enough to cover the entire planet in a layer half a metre thick, is sequestered away in the core, far out of our reach. But asteroids aren't big enough for this gravitational sinking process to have taken place. So, unlike on Earth, valuable metals and other elements are spread around much more evenly and therefore far more accessible. As a result, pound for pound, asteroids are significantly more valuable than an equivalent volume of mantle rock here on Earth. And we really are talking ridiculous numbers here. The most valuable asteroid so far identified is Davida a large chunk of rock in the main asteroid belt that's about 300 kilometers across. According to our current best estimates, Davida contains various resources with a combined value of about 27 quintillion dollars. That's about 27,000 times the combined GDP of every country on Earth, and significantly more money than human beings have made in the entire history of our species. And that's just one asteroid amongst literally millions just floating around in our cosmic backyard. But with all this unimaginable wealth just waiting to be mined and brought back to Earth, why aren't we doing it already? Well, we have actually tried. Back in 2012, a company called Planetary Resources, backed by the likes of Google's Larry Page and Eric Schmidt, claimed it was going to kickstart a brand new trillion dollar industry by mining asteroids as early as 2025. But that lofty goal was never realized, and just six years later the company was quietly sold off and its asteroid mining efforts effectively mothballed. Several other companies have made similar claims in the last 10 years or so, but none of them have even come close to making that dream a reality. In fact, as of today, as a species, we have collectively managed to mine a grand total of 250 grams of asteroid material and bring it safely back to Earth. And that was thanks to NASA, rather than some futuristic space miners hunting for profit. But why exactly is asteroid mining proving to be so difficult? We know how to get into space, and we know how to mine stuff. So how hard can it be? Well, it turns out, pretty bloody hard. The first problem is figuring out where to get the asteroids from in the first place. The asteroid belt might sound like an obvious place to start, duh, but there are a few major drawbacks of that approach. If you've ever seen The Empire Strikes Back, you probably picture the asteroid belt as a swarming mass of densely packed rocks flying around one another, but the reality is very different. In fact, if you were to jump into the Millennium Falcon and fly through the asteroid belt right now, what you'd actually see is nothing. C-3PO once put the chances of successfully navigating an asteroid field at approximately 3,720 to 1. But it turns out that smug metal bastard was lying to us. The average distance between the objects in the asteroid belt is about a million kilometers. When NASA sends probes out into deep space, they don't bother making special arrangements for the asteroid belt because there's simply no point. The odds of actually hitting anything are astronomically small. But the asteroid belt isn't just a lot sparser than you might think, it's also really bloody far away. At between one and two astronomical units, it's a round trip of a good four years or so with current technology, which isn't exactly practical for a commercial mining operation. For that reason, most wannabe prospectors have focused their efforts on so-called near-Earth objects, or NEOs. 
asteroids whose orbits pass relatively close to Earth. As of today, we've identified about 30,000 of them, and they would be much easier, and therefore cheaper, to reach than the main asteroid belt. But the trouble with near-Earth objects is that, somewhat confusingly, most of the time they aren't actually all that near-Earth. They just so happen to pass by us once in a while before continuing on orbits that might take them right back out to the asteroid belt, or even beyond. In other words, they might be relatively easy to get to, but getting back would be another story. One solution to that problem would be to rendezvous with a passing NEO, then somehow nudge it into a controlled orbit around either the Earth or the Moon, where we could mine it at our leisure. It's a promising idea, and scientists are already working on ways to modify the orbits of asteroids to prevent possible collisions with Earth, but the technology is still very much embryonic. And there are downsides too. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the potential risks involved with deliberately redirecting large asteroids towards our home planet. Some scientists even fear world leaders might deliberately weaponize asteroids in this way in the future. We also don't really know which NEOs to target in the first place. On a cosmic scale, most asteroids are tiny. That makes them hard to see from Earth, and even harder to figure out what each one is made of. You wouldn't want to launch a multi-billion dollar mining probe only to find you'd chosen an asteroid made of cheese. Well, I suppose it depends on the cheese. Assuming we do manage to identify and reach a suitable asteroid, sooner or later we're going to have to actually do some space mining, and here's where things get even more complicated. Most mining here on Earth is done with various kinds of drills and explosives, but neither would be a great option on an asteroid with minimal gravity and no atmosphere. A drill would simply float off as soon as it applied any significant force, damn you Newton, and explosives would blast most of the mined material clean off into space. Then there's a the question of what to do with all those lovely resources once they've been extracted. Should we send them back to refineries here on Earth at vast expense, or try to figure out how to process the materials we want out in space, which would involve inventing a whole bunch of new technologies? These challenges probably aren't insurmountable, but they all add up to the same thing. The real reason asteroid mining operations haven't gotten off the ground yet, let alone up into space, is money. NASA's recent OSIRIS-REx mission took seven years and cost close to a billion dollars. It brought back just 249 grams of unprocessed asteroid, which it mined through the extremely high-tech process of basically just crashing into the side of the asteroid and bouncing off it again. Scaling that effort into an industrial asteroid mining operation would likely cost hundreds of billions of dollars at the very least, and would require the development of dozens of new technologies. Even if a company managed to pull together the resources to do it, and even if everything went smoothly, and those are big ifs, it would likely be decades before anyone would actually make any money, if they even made money at all. Precious metals like gold and platinum are mostly valuable because they're rare. If Earth was suddenly inundated with millions of tons of space gold, it would crash the market overnight, and we'd all be wearing more bling than King Charles if he decided to have a rap career. I'm King Charles, look at my drip. Okay, so asteroid mining is basically a no-go then. Well, not necessarily. In fact, it may well be inevitable. Over time, the cost of mining asteroids will go down. Reusable rockets continue to reduce the per kilo price of getting things up into space, and relevant technologies will slowly be developed. At the same time, valuable resources here on Earth are going to get even more difficult and therefore more expensive to find and extract. Eventually, there may come a tipping point, where it simply makes more commercial sense to start mining asteroids. As for when exactly that tipping point will come, for now, it's impossible to say. Some economists speculate it may never arrive, and we'll simply get better at identifying and extracting hard-to-reach resources here on Earth. Others think we're only a decade or so from pointing our drill skywards. Only time will tell who's right. Whether or not that day ever comes, it's worth pointing out that asteroid mining might do a lot more for humanity than supply us with valuable resources and turn a few billionaires into trillionaires. 
It may one day help our species to colonize the solar system, and perhaps even the entire galaxy. As we've seen, in the short term, we're likely to focus on mining NEOs. But once we get the hang of things there, we might turn our attention to the main asteroid belt. Rather than ferry everything several astronomical units back and forth between there and planet Earth, it would probably make sense to set up a base on or in orbit around Mars, which is significantly closer to the belt. Putting a human colony on Mars has long been a stretch goal in the Kickstarter campaign for humanity's long-term survival. But like everything else in space, actually pulling it off would be phenomenally expensive. Back in 2019, Elon Musk estimated the cost of building a Mars colony at up to $10 trillion, far more than we can afford to spend right now. But if we could mine a few quadrillion dollar asteroids whilst we're out there, a hypothetical Mars colony might actually pay for itself. Looking even further into the future of our species, Asteroid mining might one day dramatically increase the potential duration of missions in deep space. A large colony ship with advanced asteroid mining capabilities and some nifty 3D printers could conceivably become self-sufficient, gathering all the fuel and resources it needs as it travelled amongst the stars. Of course, these are all developments that exist far in humanity's future, if they ever exist at all. But mining a few nearby asteroids in our cosmic backyard may just be the beginning of a journey that will eventually take us beyond our solar system and out into the great unknown. The exciting part is that some of us might still be around to witness the very first steps. Thanks for watching. Just a quick word to say that I couldn't make these videos without the support of my Patreon members. Consider joining the exclusive 42 Discord community by supporting me on Patreon. It's a great place to discuss my videos with like-minded individuals and myself. The link's in the description, but if you don't want to, or you can't join my Patreon, then please don't worry. A simple like or comment to say thanks would also put a huge smile on my face. Thank you.